everybody, I'm Jeremy from Black Magic Craft. This is JP, and together we designed this game, Idols of Torment. Here it is. In this video, we're just gonna give you a brief introduction to what kind of game it is and some of the core mechanics. Why did we make a game, JP? We needed something to do in between D&D sessions. So the goal was to make a game that could be set up and played in a short amount of time, but provided a lot of opportunity for the other fun parts of the hobby that you do when you're not playing. Modeling, crafting, painting. And that's exactly what this game is. Another big goal was to make this game approachable uh, for people who aren't familiar with skirmish games, right? That's probably the first number yeah. one goal. We also wanted a game that didn't need a ton of stuff to play and was really accessible. There's a few things you need. You need a board. Yeah, so it's played on a two by three area. Make your own, use our battle map, whatever you want. You're also gonna need the game pieces set. It includes lost miniatures. There's these eight really cool models. It also includes initiative tokens, uh, some unit markers, and a measuring tool. You can get these in hard plastic on a sprue or 3D print them. In addition to that, there's an echo deck. This is the brains for both the world and the lost. You can use the cards or you can use the table in the book. You just need your basic set of polyhedral dice. You don't need big handfuls of D6s. And of course, the fun part, you need your player minis, your idols. So this game is technically miniature agnostic. Rules as written, make your own, craft your own, it's fine, we don't care. Of course, we wanted to design our own perfect vision of these orders and these idols. So there are official minis you can 3D print. Now, each player has eight models plus one special model, and you have the same distribution of classes. This was a really important part of the game system was to create something that really felt like your classic two-player strategy game. We each have the same tools, the same number of models, the same number of classes, each order is both thematically different for, you know, visual sake and how you want to model your characters, but also in terms of extra abilities. So within those eight models, each player has two slayers. The slayer is the idol class specialized in melee combat. And then you're going to have two lurkers. The lurkers are the only idol class that can actually take range attacks. And then you're going to have two stalkers. The stalkers are really neat units that specialize in moving around the echo, fantastic at intercepting enemy positions, a really fundamental part of the strategy. And then you got your corruptor and your reaper, which each of you has one of. The corruptor is responsible for binding the lost. Although all models can reap, the reaper is especially built for that purpose and has all sorts of rules that facilitate that. There's an extra model, which isn't a character, a bigger model on a bigger base, and it's called the totem. The totem plays a couple roles within the game system, like drawing the loss towards it. If you flip an echo card that has that particular value, it also acts as a beacon for delivering eternal powers. We'll talk about eternal powers in a little bit. And just thematically, it's the gateway for your idols to enter this realm at the start of a game. Now let's talk about actually setting up the table for a game. We already have one laid out here. And this is a terrain based game. I would say that this example setup would be on the minimum light side for a regular game of how much coverage there is. You can absolutely clutter your table with more terrain if you want. It's just going to change the dynamics of the game and make it play out differently, which is one of the goals, making every game feel a little bit different. Obviously, if you're playing a scenario, there'll be specific terrain yeah. setups, specific types of terrain that you might need to use and rules that even go along with that. So when you're setting up a game, regardless of whether you're playing a standard game or a scenario, there's always four steps. We've already completed step one, which is placing the terrain. If you are playing a scenario, like we said, there could be some specific instructions on how to do that. The other three steps are, you need to place the lost miniatures, you place your totems, and then finally you do your deployment. And a lot of the spirit of this game is really baked into the deployment. The echo is this afterlife realm. These idols are trying to get in. So this moment the deployment is a cinematic reenaction of this process of the idols phasing into the echo and going to harvest the souls. Yeah. We need to roll a dice to see how many lost we have. So roll a d4. We have one plus four, which means we're gonna have five lost models in this particular game. So now to decide who places the first lost, it's just a simple d20 roll off. 
I got a seven, you got a four. four, four. So I'm gonna take the first deployment of a loss. You can place them anywhere on the board with the exception of a nine inch perimeter. They can't be within nine inches of the play area edge and two lost can't be within three inches of each other. Staircase is fine. Anywhere in rubble or terrain is fine, but you're not gonna deploy it on the top of this ledge here where they could never get down. So now we're gonna go back and forth until all of the lost are deployed. The next step is deploying our totems. I get to go first as I had the high roll. And these totems can be placed anywhere except within six inches of a lost and 12 inches of an enemy totem. Make sure I'm six inches away from a lost. Now JP can place his. Now the really fun part is deploying our idols and that's where these initiative tokens come in. There's 20 tokens and they're labeled one through 20. You wanna put them in your draw bag and you're each gonna draw eight tokens, one for each of your idol models. Now that we both have eight, we can lay them out in order and see who has the highest number. It looks like I have the highest number here, which is an 18. So I'll be deploying the first idol. I actually have the next one as well. So I'll get to deploy two idols before Jeremy gets to deploy his first one. Essentially, you just go back and forth, spending your initiative token to deploy whichever idol you'd like. So in a standard game, essentially the entire play area is open for deployment. There's no, there's no board side or corner. I got the 18, so I'm gonna place my Reaper model first. I can place my model anywhere on the board as long as it is three inches away from a Lost model or any other enemy model. It also cannot be placed in impassable terrain similar to the Lost. Mm -hmm. Again, we can't place models in an area where they're just not gonna be able to move. Once you've deployed a model, you spend that token and put it back in the draw bag and go through until all your models and all your tokens are spent. Our idols are now all deployed and we have this incredible chaotic setup and we can move into our first round. Each round consists of an opening and then the players move through their player turns. In the opening, three really important things happen. First, we reveal an echo card. All right, so this echo card tells us three important pieces of information. Number one, the lost are gonna move away from nearby idols six inches. We're each gonna draw two additional tokens when we draw our tokens. And the power manifest modifier for the round is plus three, which will come into effect when we start doing eternal powers. Basically this echo deck represents the world and its influence over what we're doing what the losses do, how much action our idols get, and how difficult it is to manifest powers. This is the cosmic realm influencing the game. Exactly. Every round, you're going to draw a number of initiative tokens equal to the amount of idols you have on the board in play, plus this number. We both have eight idols, plus two, we're gonna draw 10 tokens each. If there's ever a situation where this is a three and you have eight idols, you don't draw 11 tokens. There's only 20 in the bag. A player can only ever have a maximum of 10. Now we've each drawn our 10 initiative tokens. The last step in the opening is the lost make their move. So we flip the card with the lost moving six inches. There are actually three other options that could happen in the deck. The lost don't move at all. They move away from nearby idols nine inches. And one of the options is lost move towards the closest visible totem. The lost are in one of two states. They're either bound or they're unbound. As we mentioned earlier, the corruptor's main role is to bind these lost. This is the first round of the game, so obviously they're all unbound. So in this case, all lost are gonna move six inches away from the nearest idol. Now we need to resolve these lost movements and we do that starting with the lost that is closest to the echo deck. So the closest one would be this guy right here. This setup is simple. Sometimes things are a little bit more complicated, but the AI chart for the lost movement takes care of every scenario. Since this lost is closest to this idol, it's gonna move six inches in a straight line directly away from him. In that line, there is some impassable terrain. It's something that a lost can't go over. So it's gonna move in that line until it can't move anymore, it's gonna stop. If this wasn't there, he would continue moving right into the path of JP's Reaper. And this is where the setup and deployment and the movement becomes very exciting because it's like a cat and mouse game where the lost are just going all over the place. After the first, you just move on across the board in order and resolve all of the lost movements. I have the 20, so I take the first player turn. We'll show you a couple player turns here and a couple activations and a couple eternal powers. When you have a token, you can do one of two things. You can either activate a model or perform an eternal power. Turn structures 
are not one-sided. It's a constant back and forth between players. Now, obviously when moving your models, you're going to want to move them into situations where they can attack your enemies or reap the lost. When moving a model, you can move your model into an engaged status with an enemy model. The engaged status allows a model to take the attack action on an enemy model and the reap action on the lost model. But when two enemy models are engaged together, there are some specific restrictions that come into play. First of all, when a model is engaged with an enemy model, its list of actions is reduced. And this creates a lot of strategic opportunities. For example, if I were to engage a Reaper, that Reaper would not be allowed to take the Reap action if it's engaged. The engage status actually locks models together as well. They almost become trapped in orbit with one another. When you break the engage status with an enemy model, that model gets to take a backlash. A backlash is essentially an attack that you make when it is not your activation, kind of like a reaction. So JP has moved his Slayer towards my Reaper to take an attack action. Once you've done that, you take your initiative token and you place it beside the model. That way you know it's been activated in this round. Attacks are resolved in a combat sequence involving a couple roll-offs between both players. There's first a hitting step and second a wounding step. To resolve the first step, hitting, we both roll a d20 and add modifiers. The attacker adds his attack modifier and the defender adds their defense modifier. So my Slayer failed to hit, but not only did he fail to hit, the defense role of the defending Reaper uh, was by five or more. And this is the other situation where a backlash comes into play. Yep. Jeremy's Reaper gets to attack me right Basically back. attack so poorly, I get to hit him back. So now and we're I going to rewind and go back to the hitting step, but I'm the attacker. But I also failed, so nobody hits anybody. Let's say one of our attacks, JP's, had actually been successful and you hit. We would then move into the wounding step. The wounding step again is another roll off of contested rolls, but this time rather than using d20s, we use the die noted on our stat blocks. In my case, it would be the damage die, and in his case, it would be the corruption die. I have 19 in the initiative, so I can take the next turn. I have a lurker hidden in this terrain here, and I can take a ranged attack at his slayer. Fire some chains at him. Models can be obscured if you're shooting at them. In this situation, my Slayer is engaged with enemy models, so it will add a plus one to its defense roll for being obscured. And we've kept the concept of obscured very simple and binary. Either you are or you aren't. And I crit. <laughs> Indeed, there is rules for critical hits. In this situation, my defense roll doesn't matter at all. Not only does he get to move to the wounding step automatically, he's gonna roll two damage die in his wounding step and pick the highest result. Yeah. In addition to that, for being a Scorn model, he has an order ability that adds plus one to his damage roll. So I'm not really thinking <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna survive this one. I automatically hit you and I have a better chance of wounding you. The corruption die for a Slayer is a D4. The damage die for a Lurker is a D8. Pick the highest, it's a six. He rolled a four. I take a wound. He takes a wound. And Slayers only have one wound. So we have our first death of the game on our <laughs> on my second activation. Dead, gone. This game can be brutal. Most of those frontline models, Slayers, Lurkers, Stalkers, all have one wound. Combat is supposed to be very high stakes. You get into a good position and let the dice decide the fate of your models. It's risky to attack because if you fail and you fail badly enough, you might die from a backlash. So now JP has the 18, so he's gonna activate his next model. Well, I'm not too keen on these lurker models shooting my models while I'm trying to get my job done. So I'm gonna boot it with my stalker over here and I think I can do that. First of all, stalkers have the agile special ability, which means they ignore terrain when moving. So he can move his full nine inches. After that, I'm gonna take the rush action, which gives me an additional six inches. I'm feeling I can close this gap. Since his action was the rush, he doesn't have an opportunity to actually attack me right now. But I have engaged this lurker. He can now no longer take the range action. So I've basically debilitated him. Yeah. In this situation, he's gonna have to try to move away from me or take the disengage action. Or kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I have 17 and 16 in the initiative and I have a corruptor and a reaper right next to a lost. So this is the perfect opportunity to perform the ultimate task in this game, reaping one of these lost souls. To make reaping easier, to have a better chance of success, I first wanna do what's called the bind action. And it's something that only my corruptor can do. He's gonna roll his corruption die and try to hit a target value. So the corruptor has a corruption die of a D8 and I have to hit a four in order to bind this lost. And I do. I'm gonna mark this lost as bound using a little jewel here. 
the final product actually has nice punch tokens that come with the Echo Deck to mark this appropriately. Not only is this Lost gonna be easier to reap, when the Lost take their movement step at the top of next round, it will move towards the Corruptor in its Lost movement step, regardless of what value is flipped on the Echo card. Essentially, if my Reaper had been back here, this still would have been a good move, because on the next step, no matter how far this Lost moves, it ignores all the other idols and it will move directly towards my Corruptor and it's doom. I'm gonna spend my 16 in the initiative to perform the reap action. Reapers have the highest corruption die in the game, giving them the best chance at success for this action. Because this is a bound lost, he has to hit a four. Now, all the rest of the lost are unbound, so if you try to reap an unbound lost, you actually have to hit a five. Given that a lot of the models only have a D4 as their corruption die, that means that a lot of these models can't even attempt to reap unless they are bound lost. Mm -hmm. The Reaper has a D10, the highest corruption die in the game, so I have a pretty good chance of hitting this four. He was built for this task. Six, now this soul is repped and I'm going to return its energy into the cosmos, back to the primordials, and take it off the board. Your boss will be happy. Yeah, my boss will be happy. And typically, after performing the reap action successfully, the model that does it is removed from the board. It uses up all its energy to, that it used to be in this echo, and it vanishes with the exception of the Reaper, because it has a special ability called Remain that allows it to stay on the board, making it super powerful for this task. And now we would just continue through the round, working through our initiative tokens. We each have eight tokens left, so there's still lots of action to be had here. We can attempt some eternal powers. Eternal powers make this game really wild. They <laughs> There's a lot of fun things you can do. So in this game, you the player are taking on the role of an eternal. You hold the power in your hand. So when you do an eternal power, you're actually generating that cosmic energy and delivering it into the Echo. This is done through your beacons. Mm -hmm. There are two models that have the beacon special ability, Corruptors and Reapers. So when you are delivering an Eternal Power, you actually measure the reach from those models. There's one more model that has that, and that's the Totem. When you deliver an Eternal Power through a beacon, that does not affect the beacon's activation. It can still move and do its turn like normal. After all, they're just conduits for this energy that's being delivered by the Eternal. As an Eternal, you have a Power Manifest die of D12. So based on the power, you have to try to hit that like a DC. We have a plus three for this round, which is the highest value that can show up on an, on an Echo card. So this is a great yeah. round. It, it means like the eternal. cosmic energy is just like really high right now. And you have a great conduit through your beacon to successfully do this. JB is gonna try to attempt Echo Form, which is a really cool eternal power. It has a target value of six. He's gonna roll his power manifest die, which is a D12 and add this modifier to that roll. So when this number is high, it's a good time to attempt Eternal Powers. Echo Form places a new piece of terrain on the board. I have to select a piece of terrain with a footprint of four inches or less. So JP is gonna be able to drop in a new piece of terrain onto the board within a nine inch circle around the beacon of his choice. Putting it right here works really well for me, hopefully blocking some of those nasty chains from hitting my models. That's just one of the eternal powers. There's other ones that can cause damage. There's ones that can pin models. There's also ones that, like Echo Form creating terrain, can destroy and remove a piece of terrain. Technically, after JP's placed this one, I could attempt an eternal power to remove it. What I won't be able to do is perform Echo Form myself. Each round, they can only be cast once. So if he were to cast Echo Form in this round, that means I can't. So if there's something you wanna do, you gotta to get to it first. If someone successfully gets reshaped to go off, that allows them to spin a piece of terrain 90 degrees. And this is so cool. And this is where round bases become really handy. You have models that are on the terrain and models that are surrounding it. This creates scenarios where you can move the terrain and then now it's gonna place this lost next to this Reaper or an enemy model out of the way. It's just, it's cool. It, it, it's cool. That should be the logo of this game. Just, just trust us. Just trust us, it's cool. So this round will end once we've either spent all of our tokens or all models have been activated. Then we move on to the next round. You collect all the tokens, you put them back in the bag, you flip another card to start the next round, you move your lost, it completely disrupts the board, 
creates all sorts of new scenarios that were unexpected. You draw your tokens based on how many models you have plus the modifier and you start that sequence again. This game can naturally resolve itself very quickly through combat and death or reapings. It can just go bam, bam, bam and be done. In this, the standard game scenario that we're playing here, you win the game by collecting more lost than your opponent. And the game comes to an end once there are no longer any lost models on the board. The game can also come to an end if one player loses all of their idol models, in which case the opponent is awarded a brutal victory. In certain scenarios, there could be completely different victory conditions. Uh, at the end of the fourth round, if there are still lost models on the board, you'll roll a d8, if you hit a three, you play a fifth round. At the end of that round, if they're still lost, roll again. If you hit a five, you play a sixth round. If the game doesn't naturally resolve itself quickly and efficiently, the world starts to close off the game. And, you know, it, it, it speeds up the process, making sure it wraps up in a, in a timely manner. And thematically, the thematically. idols phase back into the echo. It's yeah. actually called the phase out rule. And this ensures you can actually play a full game. Actually, uh, sometimes ourselves, our play testers, were able to complete two games in, in, an one, in, in an evening. Not always, but sometimes. And it makes it really efficient. I gotta say, this was a very brief overview of the game and some specifics. Obviously, there's a lot more depth to this game, and this doesn't really show the chaos of it actually being Played and you're just gonna have to play it for yourself. At the end of the day, it's just an opportunity to build really cool stuff, to make really cool models. The nice thing is that these orders are very low model count. And the idea isn't that you pick your one order that you play with all the time. You know, you're gonna play two games in an evening, switch your orders. There's so few models that you can make one of every order. It's just, it's just cool, JP. That it's just cool. cool. That's it for this Idols of Torment introduction, sort of how to play. I hope you can get on the Kickstarter while it's live, get in on this game. Uh, that way you can be playing it as soon as possible. We can't wait to hear what you guys think okay. about it. Yeah. Okay, cheers. Catch you later. <laughs>